Applications of diffraction gratings. So in this lecture, we'll talk a little bit more about diffraction gratings, different things that they can do. And then I'll step you through the details of some specific and I think pretty cool applications. Modes of operation. Historically, Dr. Wood published a paper and made some observations that really could not be explained at the time. Uh, he observed very rapid variations in the intensity of certain colors of light as he was changing angle of incidence and other things. So later, uh, Hessel came in and explained really what was going on here. So Wood defined two types of singularities, there's a type one and a type two. The, the type one, uh, Lord Rayleigh observed many, many years ago, and this is happening because as you change color, the wavelength is changing, and at some point new diffracted modes appear, and there's a rapid redistribution of power amongst all the different diffraction orders. And that can be observed, and that was very strange of why that was happening. And now we understand that. Type two are resonant effects, and gratings can also be a waveguide. And a waveguide and a grating together behave very strangely. And there's a lecture following this called guided mode resonance filters or leaky wave filters. And these are really cool devices, and it's an entirely different way that a diffraction grating can produce a spectral response. And we can make very, very narrow spectral filters. Very cool. There are three basic ways that we can use a grating. I'll call it a one-dimensional grating. And to date, we've been talking about light normally incident on these gratings. But what if light is coming from the side? So it's perpendicular to the planes of the grating. Well, if the grating spacing is about a half wavelength, we will get a band of light that gets reflected from this, and that is called Bragg reflection. And this is used a lot in thin film optical filters. They put fiber optic Bragg gratings to do dispersion compensation and filtering and, and fiber optics. And a lot of other things can be done here. Now we've been talking about diffraction gratings, and these are great for beam splitters, there's the pattern fan out gratings. Those are the things you can screw on the end of the laser pointer and make snowflakes and snowmen and, and things like that. We can make spectrally selective mirrors because it sort of acts like a mirror because it reflects light, but the angle of this reflected light is wavelength sensitive. And later on, we'll talk about doing spectroscopy and other things with that. So lots of applications for diffraction gratings. Then the last, if the period is very long, we actually get coupling between two different co-propagating modes. And we can get directional coupling. There's such a thing as long period fiber optic sensors, long period grading fiber optic sensors. And these are really, really sensitive. They can detect down to single molecules. Very cool. So let's talk about some applications. Believe it or not, when the grading period is very small, that seems like a boring case because we don't get any diffraction orders, but sub-wavelength gratings are actually quite interesting. And it is even a metamaterial. It's an artificially uniaxial medium. So it becomes anisotropic. And so we can do things like control polarization. We can introduce artificial birefringence. We can make anti-reflection coatings or just use it as an effective index where the wave sees sort of an average of the high and low index regions. So don't discount subwave gratings. In fact, we have an entire lecture in this series of lectures on subwavelength gratings. There is what's called the Littro configuration. And here we have our incident light. And what we're interested in here is the sort of retro reflection. That's maybe not quite the right word to use it, but we're looking at the plus one order diffracted mode that reflects in the same direction of the incident wave. So it's acting like a mirror, but this configuration makes this a very spectrally selective mirror. So we can not only use it as a mirror, but use it as a filter at the same time. So you can imagine locking a laser by putting these spectrally selective mirrors on either side. We can do sensors with that. And we'll talk more about litro gratings in a little bit. 
Then the pattern fan out gradings. Here we're diffracting into many hundreds, many thousands of modes, but the diffraction grading itself looks rather strange and it forms these images. And that's something else we'll talk about. And if you were to put those gratings under a microscope, you wouldn't see a rabbit in a box. You would actually see the Fourier transform of a rabbit in the box. So it looks, looks much more like mountains. Holograms. Holograms are actually stored as diffraction gratings, and we shine light through them to reconstruct the image from the hologram. And of course, spectrometry. We can't talk about gratings without talking about this, because everything that happens with the grating and how it diffracts is sensitive to wavelength. So it has an inherent ability to separate the spectral content of a signal so that we can analyze it. So let's talk more about the grading spectrometer. Here is the basic grading spectrometer. So we'll have a diffraction grading. Here we're using it in the transmission mode, probably more common it's used in the reflection mode. But the point is we have some incoming white light, which is why I'm using the gray background here so you can see the white light. And it's going to separate that into its component colors. So if we set up a detector maybe just here, now we're filtering the green light. Or if we put a wide, maybe CCD detector, then we can measure all the different color content across the CCD. And why is this happening? Well, here's wavelength, and here's the angle of the diffraction order. So these two are tied, so the angle of the diffraction order changes with wavelength. So what we'd like to do is look at this a little bit more and figure out how to make these more sensitive. So let's talk about the spectral sensitivity. So we will start with the grading equation. And then we have to ask ourselves, what is spectral sensitivity? Well, if I want it to be very sensitive, I want to spread those colors as much as possible. So what we'll do is we will look at how much the angle changes relative to wavelength. So that's the derivative. So we're differentiating the grading equation to get d theta with respect to d lambda. And here's the answer we get from that. That's telling us how much angle changes with a change in wavelength. So rather than write that as a partial derivative, uh, I'll write the partial theta as a delta theta and the partial lambda as a delta lambda. So we have the little semi equals thing here. And that's our final equation. We can estimate how much the angle changes given some change in wavelength. And that'll tell us our spectral sensitivity. Now from this equation, we can look at that and immediately tell how to make our grading spectrometer more sensitive. We want this to be a big number. So that means we can make M big. That means we'd like to diffract into higher order modes. That starts to get a little bit difficult because they're more sensitive. And once you get to higher order modes, there's a lot of other modes real close to them. So it's a little bit inconvenient from that regard. We'd like to use shorter period gratings. We'd like to diffract into larger angles. So maybe we'll come in at a, a larger angle of incidence. And we'd like to use low refractive index materials. So typically grading spectrometers will be in air. So pretty neat way to just differentiate the grading equation and that tells us how to design grading spectrometers. Here's a grading spectrometer sold by Ocean Optics, or at least it used to be, but they have this really neat picture on their website. And what you can see is it's a fiber optic cable would come in here and the light would come out of the fiber optic cable. It would bounce off of a mirror, bounce around, hit a diffraction grating. Now it starts to separate, starts to separate, and then it hits a CCD. So these pixels over here are measuring the violet light and the blue light and the green light, the yellow light, orange light, red light across the CCD. And then of course it outputs that and you can plot how much of each color is in your, your light. So it works pretty simple. It's a nice compact device and pretty low cost for motion optics. Litro gratings. These are our spectrally selective mirrors. So here's a diffraction grating and we have our incident light and we know we probably have a bunch of different diffraction orders however we want to design that but this plus one if we design our diffraction grading correctly will reflect at the same angle 
as the incident light or come back in the same direction. So it's sort of retro reflex, but it's spectrally sensitive because it's also a diffraction grating. Only one specific wavelength will diffract exactly in that direction. The other wavelengths will go in slightly different directions and we can use that to filter. So let's think about the conditions. How do we design this diffraction grating to be in the litro configuration? So we will start with the grating equation. Well, we want that plus one order diffracted mode to be at the same angle as the incident wave. Now remember, when we measure angles, it's off of the surface normal, and the angle for the diffracted modes are to the right. So this plus one's to the left, so our condition is actually the angle of that plus one order diffracted mode has to be negative theta in. So that's why the negative is there. So what we can do is plug in this negative incident four, theta one, set m equal to one, and out comes an equation and as long as this is satisfied, we can use our diffraction grating in the litro configuration, and it will work for that specific wavelength. So we're kind of doing a bandpass filter where we can select this wavelength and ignore the others over some line width. Now let's talk about the spectral sensitivity of this device. So we have our incoming light, it will sort of retro reflect, but because it's a diffraction grating and it's wavelength sensitive, it will separate those colors. So we may have a detector that's detecting some cone of angles delta theta. What we'd like to figure out is what range of wavelengths is detected within this delta theta. That's what we're trying to do on this slide. So we're going to write the grading equation for the plus one order diffracted mode. We'll also assume that we're in air. So these refractive indices have dropped and we wrote our theta plus one and we set n equal to plus one here. So we have a simpler grading equation now. So we'll differentiate to get d theta, sorry, d lambda over d theta with respect to d theta. So we differentiate, we end up here. And then we can group our d lambda divided by d theta, bring the cosine to the other side, and we end up with d lambda over d theta equals negative n times the period times the cosine of that plus one order diffracted mode. However, the plus one order diffracted mode, remember we set that equal to negative theta ints, so we can plug that in and simplify this a little bit. And here's what we get. So we can calculate now, let's, let's solve this for the delta lambda. This is the range of wavelengths that we will capture in our detector that captures this cone of angles delta theta. And of course, that'll depend on refractive index and period of the grading and our angle of incidence. So let's do an example. Let's design a metallic grading and really what that's telling us is this is being operated in the reflection mode. We're gonna operate in the litro configuration. We want this to operate at 10 gigahertz. And we're gonna operate at an angle of 45 degrees. So our angle of incidence is 45 degrees. And let's say we're capturing a five degree cone of angles. What band of frequencies is captured in there? Now notice I'm doing this with microwave frequencies and talking frequencies. And this is just a practice looking at this in terms of frequencies instead of wavelengths. Optics people always use wavelengths. Microwave and radio frequency people always talk about frequencies. So I'm just changing this a little bit so we can get used to both languages. So right away, we know our refractive index is one, we're in air. We'll set our angle of incidence to 45 degrees. And since we were given the frequency of 10 gigahertz, we can calculate the free space wavelength. It's the speed of light divided by that frequency. And our wavelength is three centimeters. Now we can calculate the grading period. So what we do is we resort to this condition for the litro grading. We solve it for the grading period and we can plug in all our numbers and we get a period of 2.12 centimeters. That period will ensure that at 10 gigahertz, we will get a retro reflection into the plus one order diffracted mode back along the incident uh, light. Right? It's not light here, our incident beam.
Now we would like to calculate the bandwidth that we will capture at the detector. So we're not going to talk about line width because we're, now we're in radio frequency, microwave frequency land. So it's, it's bandwidth instead of line width. So we previously derived an equation for the line width. We need to convert this to bandwidth. So we start with this equation, speed of light equals F times free space wavelength, and we differentiate it. Then instead of writing d lambda or df, we will write delta lambda and delta f. Now we have an equation that has both frequency and wavelength in it. However, I would like to write this either with just frequency or just wavelength. And we can borrow from our original equation to do that. Which means we can write it one of two ways. Our bandwidth, here we're writing it completely in terms of this wavelength. And over here, we're writing it completely in terms of the frequency. It's this last one that we will make use with. We had previously calculated the capture line width. We called that the spectral selectivity. Uh, so here's that equation. Remember, we derived that. So we will take this expression for delta lambda naught and plug that in up here. And we arrive at this equation. And that's what we can use to calculate the bandwidth. So we'll plug in all these numbers, and we get a bandwidth of 0.44 gigahertz. But we can also use this as a filter at microwave frequencies. Is that ever done? Uh, not that I'm aware. It's done all the time at optical frequencies. I think just the sizes at radio microwave frequencies are not very practical. But there's the example. It's still a very good example. Pattern fan out grading. This is a fun topic. So before we get into the algorithm, let me explain it this way. If we know the electric field in some plane and we let that electric field propagate a very, very far distance, it turns out the electric field we get over here is the Fourier transform of the electric field that we started with as long as we've propagated far enough. So we propagate very far, it's like doing a Fourier transform. Now this comes from Fourier optics, there's a lot behind that that I'm not going to get into, so accept that for right now. Now what is a pattern fan out grading? Well we want to pass light through something, so that when it goes out here it forms an image. In this case it's a pickaxe, it's the logo for my school. So real quickly what's happening here, so Think of this as the near field. What we're doing is we're somehow constructing the inverse Fourier transform of a pickaxe. So when that laser light goes a very far distance and we get a Fourier transform happening, now we see the pickaxe. So we don't get little pickaxe in this diffractive optical element here. We're, we're getting something else. It looks much more like mountains, as you'll see. So let's think about how to design this. One way, it's a neat way, is something called the gertzberg saxon algorithm. And so we'll do this way. We'll initialize our far field with what we want. And we want the amplitude of our light to be a pickaxe. And our eyes don't see phase. So we don't really care what this is, but let's just start out with all zeros. So that gives us a complex electric field in the far field that we want. Now let's inverse Fourier transform that to see what we would need in the near field. So we inverse Fourier transform it and we get some weird amplitude profile and some crazy phase profile. Well, we look at this amplitude, we're going to have to block a lot of light out here. This little tiny pinhole or little plus sign we'd be letting light through, that's not going to give us a very efficient element. We want to pass all the light. We would like to somehow create that pickaxe just with phase. So what we're going to do is replace whatever we got with amplitude. Just throw this out and replace it with all ones. But whatever we calculated for the phase, we'll keep that. And so this is a new near field. Let's figure out what that would look like in the far field. So we Fourier transform it. And you know what? We're starting to get something that kind of maybe looks like a pickaxe. Well, this isn't what we want. We want this kind of pickaxe. So what we'll do is we'll throw out the amplitude information and replace it with the pickaxe. 
and we'll retain the phase information. So we'll bring the phase down and this will now be our new far field with a modified phase now. So then what we'll do, we'll inverse Fourier transform that, replace the amplitude Fourier transform, and we keep doing this over and over and over. And in the end, if we do have all ones and this weird phase profile, if we Fourier transform that, we get a pretty nice pickaxe. It's not perfect. And it usually takes the Gertford Saxton, I'll say 50 to 200 iterations to converge to that. And that looks like a pretty good pickaxe. And it has this crazy phase, but we don't care. Our eyes do not see phase. So how do we do that? Well, typically we'll etch this into glass and we need to etch some kind of diffraction grating into the glass. And where the diffraction grating has uh, peaks, the light is traveling through more glass, so it will accumulate more phase. And so we can look at this phase map and really convert that into whatever kind of profile we need etched into the glass. And so, yeah, we can look at that. We don't see pickaxes. It looks much more like mountain ranges to me. So that's one way that these pattern fan out gratings are designed. And there's many other algorithms. Last topic here, diffractive optical elements. So here we have a lens and it can form images and do other things. One thing we can do is actually flatten this lens. And what we get is a diffraction grating and it will also diffract. We don't want it to do that. We'd like it to operate as a lens, but it does diffract. And so understanding a little bit about diffraction gratings can help you design diffractive optical elements like this. And in fact, there's a lot of optical elements, positive lenses, negative lenses, other things that we can flatten in the sense of a diffractive optical element.